This is episode 136 of the XY podcast with Tara Lukey. Tara is definitely one of the estate planning experts within the XY community, and she is not your typical lawyer. She believes advisors are really in the best position to help their clients reach peace of mind by protecting the assets and lifestyles they work so hard to acquire. Tara is so passionate about supporting and empowering advisors to use estate planning effectively as part of their value prop. She's created an entire blueprint course called The Art of Estate Planning, and you can find it on the XY online training platform. In this discussion with Adrian, Tara explains the four fundamentals of estate planning, how advisors can incorporate estate planning with no legal degree required, how to subtly position estate planning in all client conversations, and plenty more. If you're considering adding estate planning as part of your holistic client offering, start with this episode, then jump straight into the Art of Estate Planning course on the XY Training platform. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. And with that said, we really hope you enjoy this episode. As you scale your advice business, are you frustrated with the amount of compliance, paperwork, and staffing issues? Virtual Business Partners specializes in helping financial services firms in four areas, admin, power planning, bookkeeping, and marketing. Virtual Business Partners work with you to get your business offshore ready. This includes identifying what tasks need to be done locally and what functions can be managed offshore. Advisors find they can reduce back office costs by between 50 and 75% and significantly improve their task turnaround times. For more information, go to virtualbusinesspartners.com.au. Tara! You, it's great to have you on. Like, you have been such an amazing contributor to the XY Advisor Group. A lot of people know you. They may not know you personally, but they know your videos and your responses and the value you add to them in the group. Thank you, Adrian. It's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing in XY, so I'm very honored to be on the podcast. Hey, when you put an amazing course together, we, we like to get the course providers out there that are sharing. So if, if you haven't checked it out, Tara's done an amazing course online. Emily was very impressed. She looks at all the courses and she she um, she said very good things about it. Oh, thank you. That's so good to hear. I poured my heart and soul into making that course and it's so nice to be able to sort of get it out in the world. Well, we're happy to have it. Well, now, have you always been a lawyer, Tara? Yeah, I mean, I don't like have any like, past career. There was nothing previous. It was just like undergrad, yeah. legal, legal. Yeah, I've um, totally been on the train tracks of lawyer in the traditional legal path, which is probably why I ended up having like my third life crisis when I was 30 because I'd just been <laughs> living, great. breathing Tell me law. More. Third life crisis. <laughs> is that what, well, what is that what you call one? it when you're like um, 30? Like not a okay. quarter life yes, crisis. Yes, yes, gotcha. Um, you know, hit kind of around the 30. Oh, come 30 on, let's call it like... a quarter. It's a little bit longer <laughs> these days. Perhaps. Um, and yeah. what, was, what, was the, what was the moment? Oh, I wouldn't say it was one moment, but... What was his name? No, <laughs> um, no probably just building. and Because I, I have always been in the legal um, train tracks of a career trajectory. So straight out of um high school i I grew up in bundy i'm a bundaberg girl awesome yeah so grew up in bundy moved to brisbane to go to uni um did the double degree law and accounting got a job at a good firm worked my guts out there in eagle street for years and years um about eight years living breathing estate planning and you know like really working like i don't know 14 hours a day eating every meal at my desk, not really seeing any sunlight. Just sucking like, you dry. Well, I mean, I it, I was really into it. Like, I loved it for a, a while and then I kind of stopped loving it, but I was in too deep and I didn't really know what I was doing or why. I just kind of, you were in it. And then we, um, I was unhappy, but I wasn't really what, sure why. Um, but we kind of all came around the time that we left and set up View Legal, which is an online law firm. Um, So that was in 2014, became one of the founding uh, partners of that and a director. 
before I was 30, which I was like, yes, like killing it. Success. Um, I think I did a, I did a video on this actually in link on LinkedIn earlier this week about because I was like, yeah, I've like made partner before I'm 30. Isn't that what it's all about? But that wasn't quite working. I was like really unhealthy, burnt out, stressed out, fed up. Um, just like estate planning is a tough area to work in as well and um, wasn't really sure what I was doing. Anyway, kind of like stepped down from partnership about a year and a bit in. Just externally, I was still a director. No one really knew I'd stepped down. Still not really happy. Moved here to the Gold Coast. Yeah. Oh, where were you originally? Brisbane. Oh, you in Brisbane? Yeah. So I, I Bundy moved... to Bris Vegas. Yeah, and like I'm um I'm a very like fixed kind of girl. Like so I had worked with the same people for like ten years, lived in my like same apartment for ten years, and I was a director of a law firm living in my two bedroom apartment in um, the suburbs of Brisbane. And I had like a home office because View Legal is an online mm-hmm. virtual firm. So we didn't even have an office. Had my home office, which was the second bedroom, had this view of like the bins of the apartment complex. I thought you were about to say the Prism River. No, no, <laughs> the bins, the, the bins. And I was like, something's wrong. Like I'm not living my best life here. What? What, something's got to change, but I could I had no idea what. And then, so I moved to to the Gold Coast just randomly, um, packed everything up, moved, didn't know a soul. Um, thought, okay, that maybe that'll fix it because I'm like, and when I was in Brisbane, I never went outside. I'd just I'd get up, I'd go to yoga inside, come back, get a coffee, and work all day, and then it'd be dark and rip, rinse and repeat. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I just need to freshen things up, but. Moving to the Gold Coast didn't really fix it either because I was just a lot closer to everything. I was missing out on, but I still no, I was still working like crazy. I didn't get to go to the beach. I didn't get to do all the cool things. I was just like something's wrong. Like I was, um, so I got to the point where I had like serious burnout, and I took like three or four months off. Just didn't work. Like how did you, went how down did you know a, that you'd reached burnout? Because some oh, people, it's not very. As oh, apparent. basically, my business partners were like, I, I had, um, I was frustrated with everything. I was like cranky with everything. They were like, you know, what's going on with you? Like, so it wasn't. I would. I'd like to say I just like gracefully, <laughs> consciously just took some time out. Didn't <laughs> wait. Super mindful about the yeah. whole process. Yeah. No. No, I was just like not coping. And so they were like, I think you need some time off. And I had all the sick leaves. So I just went. And then I sat on the beach for like three or four months. And I was like, awesome. what am I going to do with my life? Do I want to be a lawyer? What's going on? Like it took took a while just for my like sympathetic nervous system to just stop Settle. being in flight or fight and work out well, what am I, what am I going to do with my life? Like I've already been what I thought was a, my idea of success wasn't feeling like success to me where to what do I do do I even want to be a lawyer like what estate planning is a is a weird area to be involved in you know like on the whole we do Australia does estate planning really poorly oh it, do we well in the sense that the okay. statistics are that there's 75 percent of people don't have a will okay how's that compare internationally um uh, probably the same okay. i'm not as good at the statistics internationally, oh, you're saying it's just pretty shit. <laughs> i mean when you think about what's what's the rate of people dying like 100 percent Every, everyone dies does, <laughs> so, does getting cryogenically frozen does that count as be still yeah i mean i guess you need someone to manage things even if you're frozen. You still need a state plan, I guess. <laughs> what if something goes wrong with the freezing process? Exactly, but. exactly. <laughs> so when you think about it, 100% of people die. Mm. Only about 25% of people actually bother dealing with that proactively. Mm. Why? Lawyers are not doing a great job at motivating people to mm. get their estate planning done. Like the system is kind of broken. And especially when you, not that I want this to be about statistics, but when you look at like those 25... Just generalize a little bit. <laughs> well, when you look at like the 25% of people who have wills, so if 75% don't, then 25% do have a will. 
this they they've shown it in um there's a, a really good 2017 um study so of those 25 percent the people who also have young kids or minor kids um, about 60 percent of them don't have a will that nominates the guardians so they have mm. a will but they haven't updated it to say who's going to look after their kids and to me that is just a big red flag that something is wrong because what do people care about like their, their kids, kids. Yeah. like if something is going to motivate them to actually get it sorted it would be their kids right well generally in the for the advisors out there i think the conversation is the kids that usually yeah. brings it into the face yeah so to me i think that is just a big signal saying like the the process of getting your estate plan done is not working it's way too hard lawyers are not making it easy for people to get their estate planning done um what do you think the impediments well what were the impediments that you're saying so oh look i think it's expensive i think lawyers uh, some some, look i'm not speaking for all lawyers because there are lawyers who do have ongoing relationships with their clients but a lot of the legal work is transactional so they only see it's easy for a client to dodge the lawyer Mm. i think um i don't think people want to prioritize paying for their estate plan or, or there's a lot that needs to happen for them to prioritize, you know, allocating funds towards it. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there's the, all of the psychological issues around, well, I don't want to think about my own mortality and will I jinx it if I actually like do an estate plan? And it, it's just, it's just really easy to sort of put it on the back burner. How, how do you find advisors at, at uh, identifying the needs and I guess getting them to uh, estate planning specialists. Do you think? Do you think that they do a good job? Do you think there's a lot of work to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head. That to me, advisors getting involved in estate planning is key to trying to actually solve part of this problem because the the advisors who have the most contact points and the deepest relationship with their clients are probably the ones going to have the most amount of success in motivating people to actually get it done. Mm. So I have been working with advisors who are interested in estate planning for a long time now, about six years. Um, View Legal was set up especially to serve them. Mm -hmm. And I used to run our online estate planning platform there as well. So talk to a lot of advisors there about why they should get involved or how they can do it and how they can use that particular process that view legal offered and i would see what worked for them what didn't um the knowledge gaps all of that so on the whole um there's a lot of advisors out there who are doing an amazing job um that they're using the estate planning process to entrench themselves as a trusted advisor um they're covering off on their compliance risk you know what's the point of getting all this insurance in place and sorting out the super if we don't know where it goes at the end of the day and also they're finding ways to partner with a legal solution that actually allows them to make money from Mm. from the process Mm. so not only are they using estate planning to have really good legacy um, you know trust building conversations with their clients about legacy about their family so making them you know, strengthening that relationship, but they're also making money from it. So to me, I feel like we've you, got it all wrong. Do you think, um, do you think advisors need coaching to have these conversations better? Or do you think most of the time it's actually just taking that step of once they've identified the need that there is this solution? Like, now, <laughs> what's your experience? Oh, look, you're, your I mean, experience? you're asking, a, is that a loaded question? Because well, enter, enter like, the art of estate planning. Well, see, the, the thing is, like, <laughs> advisors know this is an issue. It's it's a standard sort of framework of yeah. advice. It's a standard element. Um, a lot of, um, quite a number of advisors will, it may stop at the will or suggesting that a will is what, just go get a will. I told them to get a will. Yeah. Or I got the binding death nomination. Yeah. And what we're talking about is taking things to the next next level. Yeah. So, so I think the reason why advisors who aren't talking about estate planning aren't doing it is because 
lawyers are a pain in the neck. So I think it's it, finding the right legal solution to partner with, I think is one of the biggest challenges because um, not all lawyers are collaborative. Um, and if the lawyer or the legal part of that process is not done well, it can absolutely damage the relationship. So if you don't have price certainty, process certainty, if the lawyer is not working collaboratively, then, you, you know, it's a disaster. Mm. So I see a lot of advisors going, oh, it's just in the too hard basket. We don't know. We, we can't give it's legal advice. Trust, risk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, we don't, I'm not, no one is saying that the advisors should be giving any kind of legal advice. Um, it's more about project managing or facilitating the process for their clients. So find, you've got to really find the right legal solution um, that is going to complement the process. So I think that's one of the barriers. Um, historically, I think it's also... I don't know that the legal industry has welcomed advisors into the estate planning conversation and mm. there can be a little bit of an you know an imposter syndrome almost saying well why am I am I going outside of my scope like why am I doing this I'll just refer you off to a lawyer um, so I, I think I, I think advisors are actually really well suited to talk about the estate planning not not to give legal advice but when you look at the estate planning... Do you think there's a defensiveness on the legal side around how far advisors go into the, that space that they sort of want them to just sort of, um, I don't know, um, they're not a lawyer, like sort of let me do my job sort of thing and they're not, that sort of puts a bit of a distance between the interaction. Yeah, I, I, I do hear that, that there's, you know, I talk to accountants and financial advisors who say, oh, well, all of a sudden we're cut out of the process or we don't have control. Mm-hmm. Um, not all lawyers are like that, of course, and there's, you know, in our Art of Estate Planning Facebook group and community, we've got some great collaboration going on mm. um, and everyone is recognising the value that each of the different disciplines brings to mm-hmm. the conversation. But I definitely think historically... Um, oh, look... Lawyers are known for being a bit arrogant and um, <laughs> protectionist <laughs> traditionally, so I definitely think there's that a bit of that going on. But it's changing. So you're talking about that Facebook group. So um, what are the people that are, are gravitating towards this group? Um, so it is, it's evolving for sure. So it started with me setting it up for the people in my course and then I just letting everyone in basically who's passionate about yep. using estate planning um so accountants financial advisors and then um there's quite a few lawyers in there as well who are um, interested in maybe they're not specializing in estate planning but interesting in growing it or are estate planning specialists but want to collaborate so yep. it's a really cool community where there's a mix of all three disciplines um And yeah, everyone's kind of helping each other out, answering each other's questions, throwing in their two cents from, you know, their industry perspective. And it's a really positive, collaborative place. Have you, have you sort of um, come up with ideas for new courses out of, off the back of it? Is it providing like, like, like does estate planning change dramatically um, over time or what, what are the, or is it just, it's, there's just, has it stayed the same, but. There's just always so much complexity that the people, it, the rules don't change. It's just the people change. Yeah, look, not a lot of it does change. You'll have little tinkering, but it's certainly not, you know, as radical as the changes that we see in the superannuation um, regime. Mm-hmm. But for instance, those changes to super impact on estate planning. Totally. You know, like the one point six million dollar cap. You know, we, all of a sudden that creates a whole host of estate planning mm. challenges. Well, actually, while, we're, while we're on it, what, what are some of the things that if, if advisors aren't fully aware about that have, have really rocked up for, with those rule changes? Uh, oh, sure. Well, I mean, all of a sudden the whole question about, well, BDBNs, how, do they, how are they structured? What's going on with the super funds? Um, you, you can't just assume that you know we'll just make a bdbn in play or binding death benefit nomination um so that's a perfect example where 
the lawyer and the advisor should be collaborating yep. because I'll, you know, a client might come to see me and I'll um, always want to work with their existing advisors mm -hmm. and I'll go, oh, okay, well, I can see that if one of you dies, the survivor will be over the cap. And usually the advisor is already on top of that and mm -hmm. will have had a plan or a strategy and, and we'll have to work together to mm -hmm. determine, well, what are we going to do here and how does that impact on the estate plan? So there's, there's actually like a lot of areas. If you're doing the estate planning properly where the financial advice or the tax advice should interact with the estate plan, mm. but there's a lot of lawyers who do it in isolation. Mm. And Without all the like, yeah. super rules. and they don't, kind of Yeah, they don't even understand what's going on on the financial side of things. And I'm not trying to have a go at those lawyers. Oh, that's all right. You know we go. Well, yeah. estate planning is a hard or it's a funny area because every lawyer is expected to be able to just pump out a will. It doesn't matter if you're a property or, an, you know, yeah, a, a generalist yeah. or whatever. Everyone thinks that you can just do up a quick will for them. And you, you always want a bit of want a quick buck. So like, yeah, you take exactly. the will job. Exactly. How hard can it be? And so, and it's you know, simple law, isn't it? I mean, like, yeah. And also like, you know, you don't find out if it was done incorrectly for ages until they die. Mm. So, you know, not, hopefully not your problem. So I think there's a lot of um, lawyers who do it in isolation. Is it actually, that's a good point. Is there any recourse that ever comes back around the setting of wills, like that back to the lawyer or the advisor or whoever's involved with that? Because you, you always hear about yeah. the fights and the challenges around the execution of a will, but is there any challenges on the, the drawing up of the will at the time? Uh, I yeah. suppose besides maybe um, our capacity to execute and that sort of thing. Yeah, look, there, there definitely is. Um, there's been instances of like negligence actions against lawyers who haven't acted properly. And, um, you know, we see a few. I saw, I think there was disciplinary proceedings against a Queensland lawyer last week, um, or it was announced last week because they didn't even actually go see the, the client. They kind of took instructions from like a, a interested son or something. So, uh, okay. there's, look, there's definitely the same kind of responsibility mm. when you draft up a will um in terms of it coming back to the advisor mm. i i'm strongly of the opinion that whenever an advisor is getting involved in an estate planning process it's purely to facilitate or project manage yep. you're not insured to give legal advice leave that to the lawyers keep the law but you know you the value that you add is keeping the lawyer on track, getting the client to overcome their inertia mm -hmm. and leveraging the information, the factual situation that yeah. you already have. So it, like estate planning, you, I can sit here and say, oh, it's so very complex and all these years of experience. But really it, estate planning is about understanding the family and the assets and the client's legacy objectives mm -hmm. and then documenting that. So if you think about those three things, you guys are already doing that. It, yeah. Exa exactly. You already have a relationship where you know about the client's family. Um, you already have a good idea on the financials. Some, you know, not every lawyer knows how to read a balance sheet even. Um, and then if you're already talking to the client about, well, what are your goals? What are your financial goals? You know, goals-based advice. Well, the next extension of that is, well, what's your goal for your legacy? It's true. How, and you'd be at the forefront of this. I've always been quite um, interested in the philanthropy space and, and what people can do. I'm sure I use, um, I suppose those, those conversations I'm imagining come to the fore when you have, when you start getting pen to paper and this sort of stuff. Is that... Does well, that... it's so interesting you brought that up today because I did a Facebook Live about philanthropy today. Did you see awesome. it? No, I haven't. Oh, I've isn't that serendipitous? Um, what did you say? Well, it wasn't me doing much of the talking because um, I, I, I don't know. I don't talk a lot about uh, – it's remiss of me as a lawyer 
and it's something that I'm sort of starting to work on and change my processes with, but philanthropy doesn't really come up unless mm-hmm. the clients raise it. So we had Amanda Sato of, um, she's a consultant to the Elston yes. private group. Yep. So she is a philanthropy specialist yeah, cool. and, um, we had her on in our weekly Facebook live. So every week in the art of estate planning group, we have a weekly live mm-hmm. where we do like a learning module or a topic or yeah, cool. they just have to hear my ramblings. And so I um, interviewed Amanda today to talk about um, how financial advisors and lawyers should be having these conversations about philanthropy. Mm. And, and it, you know, it really got me thinking, I'm like, well, yeah, that's a critical part of the it's legacy. It is, but you, look, us lawyers are not trained the way that you advisors are mm. to talk about goals. Where you know, who do you want to look after your money? Okay, where do we want it to go? Okay, that sounds like there's a new adventure coming. <laughs> I'm pos- yeah, I think so. Are you are you considering it being um, more of a part of a structured process that you use or? Like, um, the philanthropy, yeah. yeah. Look, definitely building it into um, my conversation templates around talking about the estate plan and what they want to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, still, got, I've still got a lot to learn on it yeah. in terms of. But I think the first part is even just being aware and asking. The, totally. the, yeah, it's interesting. With um, it's definitely not at the forefront of clients' minds a lot of the time. But when you delve deeper in terms of what's important to them, you sort of start to understand that there is this stuff is like it can be quite significant for them, but they just haven't gone through the thought process to to get to that stage where yeah. oh, actually maybe I should include that in my estate plan. Like I feel that strongly about it. Like I don't really care about the kids that much. Like, <laughs> rather, the cats get taken care of. Like. Um, <laughs> That's the, I don't know, I think there's a huge space for it. It's oh, ab- absolutely, yeah. In, um, I think it just ties back into living purposefully and mindfully and deciding, you know, not being on autopilot and, and helping work out, well, where, yeah, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to go? How are we going to achieve that? Mm. Which is your domain, right? It's a, it's definitely a definitely, few advice conversations in that. That's yeah, lawyers are definitely not bringing up those conversations you guys could you could yeah this could be the new this group that you start and get a few more lawyers in there yeah but i mean i see my role or and the new wave of legal estate planning lawyers role as supporting advisors you you guys are already doing this and doing it really well and you have been for a long time so i see our role as coming in to support you to take control of documenting and implementing those discussions that you're having rather than you know trying to re- replicate recreate this yeah sort of i mean in-depth advisory conversations that's yeah that's it's that's cool it's it's sort of um it's interesting talking about um I've had a few conversations the last few days around where the advisor role stops and where it starts and a lot of it's been around the money coaching side of things mm. and but this is this is another exact example of that where like well no one can sort of be across everything so this is where you just need to know the trigger points and off to tara yeah exactly i mean i'm not advocating for financial advisors to become lawyers or or get that legal knowledge but i think that you have a huge advantage in helping your clients overcome some of this estate planning inertia simply because you see them probably the most out of all of their advisors mm. and you have a relationship with them. So it, uh, you know, one of um, the guys who's gone through my course, Tim Henry, and he, mm. he was already great at estate planning before, but um, he's just used it as, as a sort of a systems tool and, and training up his staff as well in his business. But he, you know, he's been doing this for about three or four years. And so now he just talks about it or brings it up every time he sees the clients until they finally go, okay, okay, we know, we know we're going to do it. Let's do it. (laughs) You know? And so you don't have to do the hard sell every time, but if they know that every time you see them, you're just going to say, look, we need to get this sorted. Here's why, you know, 
who's going to look after the kids? We need to get this sort of. Like what if you're both in an idea. act? Like I've I've done that and yeah. One of the, actually the situation I'm thinking of is when um, <laughs> it was about the guardianship for the kids and they they just the partner the husband didn't trust the wife's preference for guardianship. So there was this like stalemate that was just going on. I'm like, guys, come on, you got to come up with something. But they just wouldn't. I kept on. You can't ignore up. it. What do you do? Just leave it up to chance as to who dies last? Maybe I, should, maybe I need to push harder. <laughs> That's probably what it is. Well, to me, I, I feel that that is the value that you add. They need to sort it out. Mm. It is hard, but they need to sort it out. And you are privy to these conversations. You know what, what you know which heart strings to pull if um it, to to motivate them and that is a huge amount of value that you can add by actually getting it sorted for them because i bet you every time you know they hear a story about someone dying young or it, you know it comes up they just get this like sh- terrible like chill down their spine going oh that's not done but it's too hard like mm. give them peace of mind let them know it's sorted and that you sorted it for them and that any time anything happens they just have to come to you and you will sort it out do you with with some of the advisors that you've been working with do you know what are some of the um i guess the best ways that you hear from them that are effective in these conversations or specifically around estate planning look definitely having um i don't know if this is the right phrase but like heart-based conversations Mm so just almost conversations that lead them to realizing that they need to get it sorted themselves so just saying well what would happen in this situation what would you want to happen Mm. here's what's going to happen because the thing is even if you don't have a will you do have an estate plan the the government gives you one yes it's the state government whatever you exactly whatever you die i don't know they'll sort it out how happy are you with the government's Decisions. decisions right now it can be questions <laughs> yeah don't why why leave such an important important um choice to the default rules you're not a default person like but this on the flip side of that this is sort of going to be a bit hopefully entertaining is that the some people maybe they shouldn't get to choose with some of the decisions <laughs> they make now i remember we had um you know vic vic um sunder Yes. Uh, yeah, he, he was on the podcast a while back and um, he was talking about how a lady wanted to leave everything to a cat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the challenge around that. Have you have you had similar situations or um, things that are a bit more outside the box and you're <laughs> like, oh, yeah, okay, that's your wish. Oh, look, not, not anything that crazy. And I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a straight talker. I will just say no. No, we're not, do- we're not doing that. The dog as well. We're not doing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Otherwise, if you don't take care of this risk, the dog has a right to claim. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't entertain crazy um, instructions like that. Um, Send them back to the drawing board. Yeah, exactly. No, you guide them through making a sensible choice and and understanding what their viable options are. And, you know, maybe that's where the philanthropy conversation comes in. Totally. You know, it's not the cat, it's a charity for cats or something. Cat Caring Association. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And, like, you're talking about the percentage of people that have and don't have, and I guess also... It's also just that if you look at the demographics of the baby boomer population and that just shift that's happening, they're getting older. They're, yeah. they're getting into that sphere where, yeah, there's an increased likelihood of like them sort of ending up um, using that piece of paper. <laughs> the one way to put it. Yes. Yeah, but you know what? It's not just baby boomers. It's young couples. Oh, With totally. Kids. The risk is there for uh, everyone. Uh, even to me, I'm just as passionate for them to get their estate planning sorted because particularly if they've gone to the effort of going through an insurance exercise mm-hmm. and have a decent amount of insurance mm-hmm. there, the, the difference to that family if they lose one mm-hmm. of their breadwinners of having a testamentary trust mm-hmm. or not is life-changing. The tax consequences. And, yeah. Well... Yeah, the foregone tax consequences because mm. basically if they have a testamentary trust and that insurance money goes into the trust, 
every child every year while they're under 18 gets about $20,000 mm. tax free. Mm-hmm. So if you've got two kids, first 40000 of income generated from investing that inheritance is tax free money that can be used to pay for school fees, living expenses. Like imagine if all of the school fees could be paid for with pre-tax money. And then when those kids grow up and have children of their own, they do it again. Mm. To me, that those no benefits are just immense and they will make all the difference. You know, if a family has gone through a situation where they've lost one of their parents mm. at that, you know, when there's young kids, like at least ease the burden, the financial burden on the surviving parent by having the right structure in place. I guess the, well, that's the financial side, but I guess the, the, ch- the issues of where the kids end up as well. Um, yeah. If there's both parents pass away. Yeah. That's... Exactly. And and then if you don't have, say, like a proper testamentary trust structure in place and both parents pass away, mm. the kids will get their money when they turn 21. And we're going to be talking like pretty significant sums mm. if they've got a significant amount of life insurance. I don't know how many young people do you see just like blow through their they're inheritance. They're really good. They're really conscientious, <laughs> and they, yeah. yeah. They just save it off. Yeah, yeah. Reinvest. Just we'll stick it in the super. Dividend Max reinvestment out the scheme. Yeah. yeah, like it. You can. It makes the difference between setting these kids up with money that is going to last them for their whole life, or just putting them in a situation where they'll blow it all and and live to regret it. And you can put, um, I'm just trying to just delving into my memory of like, uh, what, what the toolkit is around in there, but oh. you can, you can put, um, restrictions and all sorts of things that allow, you think they're going to be a bit, maybe a bit of a late bloomer. You might put a few more years on them, maybe out to 25, things like that. Can you? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So you can rule from the grave as much or as little as you want. So, you know, in the absence of any kind of complexities you may not put in that many restrictions you might just leave a morally binding letter Mm -hmm. that accompanies the will to the people who you've nominated as the financial controllers so that's that's the important decision Mm. choosing who is going to manage the finances or the combination of people who will do that if you know if both young parents aren't around and empowering them to make the right choice. And so having a conversation around, well, who is in your inner circle of trust? Mm -hmm. Who are you both going to feel will do the right things by your kids if you're not here? That's not a legal conversation. Not really. I mean, there's frameworks around, you know, the kind of being convicted of an offence or bankrupt or whatever, but it's not a legal conversation. What if you really wanted that person that's been convicted of an offence to be the guardian? Can you still get them to be the guardian? I don't... Well, you mean a guardian or a trustee? Ooh. Either. Well, it depends. I don't don't think they can be a trustee. It depends on what state they're in. Okay. Yeah. Guardians is not as many rules. Okay. Yeah. So they can be a really good person, just had a few too many parking fines and it's all good. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a fair bit to be convicted of an offence. It's true. It's a lot of parking fines. <laughs> yeah. <That's it. laughs> but, I mean, back to my point, it, that's where if you've already got a relationship with the clients and you kind of already know what's going on in their circles, you can add a huge amount of value in guiding that discussion. Or if you don't, but you're helping them with that discussion, you know what, you, you're going to have, that's going to strengthen your relationship. It's, it's going to be a powerful discussion really, for I know, your relationship. Um, yeah, I know a lot of advisors that actually, it's a core part of how they yeah. engage with clients. Yeah. It, it's that it brings in the children. It, there's a lot of business opportunities that come out of it as well, oh, as well as yeah. all the benefits of doing it well. Well, I mean, that's it. We're, yeah, we're talking about all the benefits to the clients, but to me, it's a no-brainer for the business. You, you know, if you partner with the right legal solution, you can actually, you know, charge and be paid for your facilitation Um, you keep that wealth under management if the client dies or you're much more likely to keep it under wealth you're perfectly poised to help them with the administration Mm -hmm. Um, you connect in with the generation above or below they basically will come back to you if you've got their estate planning and, and sorted that then whenever anything happens you know they just 
going to, oh, Adrian will sort this out. I'll just check in with him. Like, to me, it's it makes perfect sense from a business point of view. So paraphrasing that, it sounds like Tara's saying you're stupid if you don't factor in <laughs> estate planning into your business model and your engagement with your clients. Paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah. Look, no. <laughs> um, look, I, I think it's a no. I think everyone would probably agree it's a no-brainer, but mm. it's been put in the too hard basket. Yeah. Well, Largely because of the lawyers. What's a, what's, is, there, is there a course that, that people <laughs> could look only, at that if only would help them take it course. out of the too hard basket? <laughs> uh, yeah, look, the Art of Estate Planning course that I put together is designed to give the roadmap of how to actually harness this estate planning opportunity. So it's for Mm non-lawyers. There's a few lawyers who've been through it, but it's, I created it for financial advisors and accountants. So it's a combination of, you know, yes, giving you all the basics that you need to know about the estate planning process, but not trying to turn you into a lawyer, Mm -hmm. Um, how to actually choose what role you want to take Mm -hmm. in the estate planning process like do you want to get your you know elbows deep in running the whole thing or are you just going to find a a really good referral relationship and and just get the clients over their inertia and 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 sort of manage that referral you don't i'm not saying you have to do the you know get fully hands-on but you should consciously know what the options are and make Mm -hmm. a choice and then it also tells you well what are the how do you find the right legal solution so how do you what are the options there online the lawyer up the road the you know national specialist how do you find them and build your um, toolkit of legal solutions so you can match them up per client and then how do you charge How do you talk to the client to get them over their inertia? So it's half technical training, but it's not, it's not at all designed to replicate like a master's of succession law or anything. Mm. It's really just meant to be like the practical roadmap of how do you get an estate planning offering live in your business? Yeah. Awesome. That sounds super valuable. (laughs) <laughs> Look, I, I think I've seen a lot of people go through it now and I really, I'm, I'm just blown away by um, the change that it has created for them. And to me, it's, I'm really passionate about just changing the way we do estate planning because the current model is not working. Let's look, re-engineer it. Yeah. And that starts with advisors taking ownership of it. It's very XY advisor if you can. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.